How's it going, Eliminators? We're following up with part three of the Craftsman Snowblower Repower. Today, we'll be mounting the engine, lubricating some various things, and I'll also be explaining how the drive system works and comparing it to the MTD snowblower you saw in last week's video. So with that being said, let's get right into it. In the last video, we finished off with basically showing you guys the mounting plates were a little bit different. If you haven't seen that, I can link that in the top right of your screen as well as in the description down below. So I once again have both engines on the workbench and what we're gonna be looking at are these engine mounting plates. So I got the tape measure out here because I wanted to show you guys some measurements. This one measures six inches long and the other one also measures six inches long. And then just measuring the width here, we have 10 and a half inches on the 1350 plate. And coming down to the 1450, we also have 10 and a half inches. So both of these mounting plates measure the same outside dimensions. So even though the plates measure the same, the 1450 had this large overhang at the back here. And if you'll notice, it does have a cutout at the back of that overhang. Whereas the 1350 here does not have that overhang and does not have that cutout obviously, but it does have a little cutout here. But here's what I noticed. You see how this has a little 45 on the corner and see how far away it is from the bolt on the 1350 plate. If we come over to the 1450 plate, you're gonna notice that the little 45 on this corner is almost right near that hole. It's quite a big difference between this one and that one. Now coming over to the snowblower, that is going to correlate to this little bearing flange. See that for one of the axles underneath the chassis here. But if we look at where that other cutout is, there's nothing here on this one. So technically I should be able to drop the 1350 with the 1350 plate onto this. And I might do that, line up my holes, and then I can try to line up the pulleys to see if anything's offset. Now, because the drive pulley does move with the engagement of the lever, I do have my little quick clamp up here. So I'm going to be clamping the drive engage handle down so that it pulls the drive plate in so that I'll be able to line up both my drive plate and my impeller pulley there. All right, so I got the engine dropped onto the chassis here. First thing we're gonna look at is that cutout near the bearing flange. Check that out. So we're clear there. Again, this one has a cutout here that uh, we really didn't need, but look at this. So on the other cover, they had that overhang, right? That comes way back here. So on this particular 1450 chassis, they have this large rectangular hole here. And I can already see the issue. If I use the 1350 with the 1350 plate, that's going to be exposed. Now I could tape over that or something to cover that up, but the 1450 plate has that overhang that would come over this. And I'm assuming they have that there to prevent snow and water essentially from going into this area. Water's gonna get in there, could cover your rubber friction disc and then cause drive slippage issues. However, having a little overhead view here, check this out. See if you guys can see that the pulleys are almost perfectly lined up. As far as everything else goes though, clearance is looking pretty good. Again, we have our oil drain tube on the side. Some people like to extend the tube with a little 90 back here, but these are simple enough. You just pull the pin, remove the wheel, and then you could drain these off. So normally these wheels don't seize to the axles. And again, we can use marine grade grease to prevent that from happening. Keep in mind, I also have the Pella oil extractor that basically has a tube that goes down into the sump and then you just pump the thing up and it sucks all the oil out of the bottom end. All right, so I pulled out the measuring tape because I wanna kind of figure out how much room we have to cover that little slot there. And from the back of the engine, again, with the holes on the plate lined up, we have about an inch and a quarter just a little more than an inch and a quarter. And I've flipped the 1450 on its side here. We'll measure with this, just to kind of get an idea. About an inch and three eighths, so over an inch and a quarter that we need. This 100% is to cover that slot. So I'm gonna go ahead and change over these plates. 
So we've salvaged pretty much the last component that we needed off of the blown up 1450. The bolts don't appear to have any type of thread lock on them. So what I'm gonna do is probably just clean them up on the wire wheel just to ensure that the threads are clear. Now, one thing I should mention is that these bolts appear to be black oxide coated, which prevents against the dissimilar metal corrosion that occurs with a steel bolt and an aluminum engine block. So if you are taking these to the wire wheel on a bench grinder like I did, you just don't want to apply too much pressure. I was just basically trying to get as much of the grease off as possible. And I might as well clean this up while I'm here. All right, so the other plate here for the 1450 is all cleaned up. This 1350 has oil in it. So I was thinking about uh, which way can I go to kind of get in a position where I can swap these plates over easy enough. And this is how I'm gonna do it just by myself here in the shop. I went starter side instead of going cylinder head side because cylinder head down, all the oil goes into the top end and also my carburetor. So at least this way, my carbs up here, hopefully oil doesn't come out of the dipstick. I can always do an oil change later on, but same process, get these plates swapped over. So check this out guys, still black oxide coated, but this 1350 was stored outdoors, remember that? So all of the corrosion that occurred on those bolts compared to the other one these ones looked pretty much brand new and i just have to keep in mind that this is going to be the back of the engine and my pulley side is the front of the engine so we can compare plates here i'm basically just swapping that over simple as that now i'm not using a lot of it but i am going to be using this permatex blue medium strength gel thread locker here and I'm only applying it to one side. It'll just be enough to coat the bolts as they go in. The gel is supposed to be resistant to like oils and stuff like that. So if there's a little bit of oil in those threads, I don't have to worry about cleaning them out. I'm not gonna torque spec these things. They do have the lock washers as well as the blue thread locker, so they should not come out in the future. So with the 1450 plate swapped over to the 1350, those little rectangular holes in the chassis will be covered. However, I just wanted to include that part number there. So if you end up having a 1350 engine, but you don't have the 1450 plate for whatever reason, you can purchase this plate shown on the left of the screen and basically just do the same swap that I did. That's the part number there. And I'll also include the price for you guys just so you have an idea. So the 1350 is mounted with the 1450 plate. Same thing, all the pulleys line up. I don't have the drive engaged at the moment and you guys are going to notice that little overhang there does cover those rectangular slots cut into the chassis so for the most part like there is still a little gap but that's how it would have come from the factory so we shouldn't have to worry about a whole bunch of snow going in there and then there's going to be three little self-tapping screws kind of deal that have the little notches on the back of the heads there to hold them in place. And I am using just a little dab of blue gel thread locker to help hold those into place. Then I'll move on to the left side because we do have this little plate we're gonna have to install. And that holds the drive idler return spring. I'm just tightening these up by hand with a little half inch offset box end ratcheting wrench here because it makes it super simple. I don't have to pull the wheel or anything like that. Continuing on to the right side, get a little bit less space over here because the engine does tend to overhang on this side a bit more, but we are installing the little plate here. Once again, that's going to be our hookup for our idler return spring. So that just hooks into this slot right up there. And I'm just finishing off with my little half inch socket on my quarter inch small ratchet. Gives me enough room to get in there and tighten those up nice and tight. You don't want to strip those, but with the blue thread locker and the serrations on the head, I should not have to worry about those ever coming loose. At this point, we can plug in our stator output wire to our electrical harness here that goes up to run the headlights and the heated hand grips. Now, this is something interesting that I was going to discuss on the last video, but it started to run a little long, so I figured I'd leave it till this one. You're gonna notice something strange here. On the output wire of this dual wire 
alternator or stator. We know that this is a 60 watt AC only alternator. And you can see that the red wire comes out on the left without the little groove there. And if we go over to this little jumper, we can see that the side with the groove on it, which is supposed to be the DC side, does not have a connector in it. Whereas they have two wires going into the left side, that's to tap into the AC of this alternator. Now, these little jumpers are from Briggs & Stratton. I can put a photo of the part number up on screen. And the reason they use that is because, let's say that our machine only had a headlight and it didn't have the heated hand grips, you wouldn't need the other dual wire there. So you would only hook up your single wire from your halogen or incandescent headlight to this, and then you would have a ground going you know, to your engine. Ours has the ground here. Again, we're gonna have to hook that up to the little flywheel cover bolt. But because this one has the heated hand grips, they don't use this, they use the double. So basically what it does is it takes the single wire from AC and then it goes into a dual and then it has this jumper. So now you have AC at both sides of this dual connector here. So we do have AC on both of these. And again, one of them is going to be to power the headlight, and then one of them is going to be to power the heated hand grips. So once again, I didn't wanna be switching stators to something that was not used on this specific engine. I wanted to use the 60 watt AC only alternator from the 1450 engine on this 1350. Again, everything's plug and play. Everything will work as it was intended to work from the factory. So up underneath the console here, we have our headlight back there. And you guys are gonna notice there's two white wires. One of them is going to be a ground and one of them is going to be a positive, again, AC. And then we have our red wires up here. And if I can get a shot of that, they are going to the heated hand grip switch. So we can only assume that down here on the loom, the white wire is our headlight wire and the red wire is for our heated hand grips. Again, on this particular model, both are running off of AC. Now, before we plug in that connector, I am using a little bit of Permatex dielectric grease, and I am putting that into the prongs there for the connectors for the stator, and also a little bit on a Q-tip here, and I'm just wiping down the electric starter. Now, dielectric grease is not a conductor, so by definition, it is technically an insulator. So you would think, why would you wanna use it on electrical connections? The insulating properties aren't enough to prevent a connection. So dielectric grease simply acts as an anti-corrosive agent. So it will prevent corrosion between, let's say, your electrical connectors. On the Stiga or the Bolins articulator that you saw in one of my previous videos, when I tried to remove the voltage regulator from that unit, it was so corroded, I had an extremely tough time disconnecting that connector to the point where I was worried that I was almost gonna rip the wires out of the stator, which is not good. So a little bit of dielectric grease will go a long way on your electrical connectors. Not sure if you can hear it or not, but it's also crazy windy outside. So you can probably hear the plastic wrap on my door there, slamming against the garage door. Tomorrow, not supposed to be as windy, so it'll be good for filming outside. Now, I don't have the chute installed to the snowblower here because I still have to do belts. So I wanna get all everything squared away with the engine first because we're gonna have to split the housing after to install the belts. I do have a video on how to replace both the drive and the impeller belts on a snowblower. Very similar to this if you wanna see that video. I can also link that in the top right of the screen. But at this point, I'm just going over simple things some zip ties and I'm finding this extra loom here and it's kind of hanging out. That doesn't look all that nice. So I think I'm gonna zip tie that. There's the cross member up here that I can zip tie that to just to uh, clean this up a little bit. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just trying to keep the wire away from the pull start. And then again, up here, there's a little bit of rust there. I can hit that with some black paint, but check this out. That's how they run this wire loom right from the factory. And here is your chute control. Check that out, like everything's just rubbing. You can see stuff coming off there. So I think what I'll do is uh, try to push that out of the way there to prevent something like a short to ground. A Little bit of Krylon black paint here, gloss black, just a couple touch up spots, nothing too crazy. Don't wanna to spend too much time on it. 
Next up, before I can install the plastic access panel, I'll get the whole bottom end greased up. All right, so greasing the underside of the snowblower here. You guys know me. I do like using the Mystic NLGI number two grease to grease the bottom of these snowblowers, particularly the hex shifter shaft, as well as the chains or gears. You don't have to put too much on it, but we want to make sure that everything is nice and smooth when we go to shift this thing around. I even like to use this Mystic grease on the chains as well. It won't go all stringy, so you don't have to worry about grease getting all over the place. Make sure we get the other chain as well. On a lot of these snow blowers that have these springs, you can see for the most part they're not painted. And these springs tend to rust. So what I like to do, especially on new snow blowers that have no rust on the springs, you're gonna take your grease and you're going to totally coat the spring with grease. You guys have been seeing me use this stuff more and more. This is Clean Flow Honey Goo. It's kind of sticky. It's really good stuff. You don't have to go crazy with it. Spray it on the inside a little bit there too. I got the glove there just to catch all the extra bits. And if you're worried about getting the lubricant anywhere other than the spring, you can put down a little shop towel or something. And we want to make sure that we get the hook here too. That's gonna be important on both ends, as well as the rest of the spring. Make sure you get a good coating on that. And then you could take your hand with a glove or not and try to rub that in as best you can. I know it looks like a lot, but I'm kind of doing it just for demonstration purposes. And like you saw in last week's video, a little bit of my refinishers select on a shop towel here. I don't have the belt in, so that's why I'm able to spin the friction drive plate around because there's no tension on it. Now, when we come up to our shift lever and push that in, that shifts nice and smooth. So the friction wheel is moving on that hex shifter shaft very easily because of that grease. We're gonna lube up all of this stuff next. Any pivot point that you guys see here, I'm going to be lubing with the honey goo. And we just wanna make sure we don't go overboard because I don't wanna get any of that on the friction plate down there. Now up top, there are going to be three different levers. Here is the main chute pivot control for left and right. Here is the deflector adjuster and then over here is our speed select lever now these work via a little spring here and you push these down and then you align this metal bracket up to these metal teeth that are cut out in this plate there so you want to make sure that you lubricate all of this stuff and once again i'll be using the honey goo to do that Same thing with the cables here. Then go the other way. It's already easier to move. Once again, the chute is not connected, so we're just lubricating the wires. Now on the left handle side, this is our drive engagement lever. You guys can see there's a big torsion spring on this one that is quite rusted. So I'm going to be spraying that down fairly well, as well as the pivot points in here. And then normally these are hooked into the lever with a cable on a lot of the MTDs. These Craftsman Husqvarna ones have the rod, so it's a little more sturdy. So we're just going to hit that with a little bit of lube. So if you had a cable with a little Z-bend that went into a hole, you wanna spray that area too. And then because this model does have the power steering, we wanna lubricate in the pivot point right there for the trigger, but also where the cable ball end connects to the plastic, as well as lubricate the cable down inside there. And then down here are the threaded rods for the adjustment on both the drive on that side, as well as the impeller. At this point, you could loosen up the lock nut, move that back, thread this down and then basically use something like a Permatex nickel anti-seize 
to coat these threads. I'm just gonna spray this down with some honey goo. Same thing with this side. This one's quite a bit rusty. I'm probably gonna have to adjust that at some point, but you guys can see, hopefully, how well that stuff like absorbs and wraps around whatever it is you spray it on. I really like that honey goo. And I'm continuing on using the dielectric grease up here. So I unplugged both the connectors for the heated hand grips and I've just put some dielectric grease into that side there. And then I might even pull the headlight connector out and get some in there as well. Okay, now this headlight housing is clipped in via these two tabs up here as well as two tabs on the bottom. If you're not replacing your bulb though, and you just want to put some dielectric grease into the connection like I do, even though these do have a little weather seal in here, you just have to pry open these two little locking tabs here and then just simply pull back on the connector. Same thing here, just a little bit of dielectric just to keep those connections nice and clean. So with the wheel off, I just wanted to show you the inner side of the wheel here. They do have these cutouts and those cutouts go right into there and there. So at this point, what we can do is remove this plastic cover because I wanna grease all in there. So once you get those two screws removed, we can pull off our plastic cover. And you guys are gonna notice right away, this is totally different from MTD's planetary gear or clutch system. So essentially what they have is an axle that comes through and your power is being transferred out to this wheel here. Now that happens through this outer cogged piece of metal. And then they have an inner one that can either disengage or engage whether or not you have tension on this cable. And then you have a little return spring here. It all looks very complex, but I'm gonna go up to the handle and pull the trigger and you guys are gonna see how simple this setup is. So you're basically driving along and you wanna steer to the left. So you want the right wheel to be powered and the left wheel to freewheel. And all you have to do is pull on that trigger. So you guys can see that whole plate or bracket there moves back which disengages the teeth on the inner cogged piece of metal. And then we have a big torsion spring in the back, see that? And that is what returns that. And then we just have a tiny little spring there that helps this little bracket that the cable moves on return. And this system is incredibly simple. You're just basically gonna spray the whole thing down with a lubricant. The inner part where that torsion spring goes around, see how that's splined? So what I've found is, especially on models like the other one that we pulled the 1350 off of, that thing was stored outside, so everything was super rusty. And again, not a lot of maintenance either. So when I told you in that one video, the first one we did, when I pulled on the power steering triggers, the things didn't really wanna freewheel all that great. And that's because this whole system can get bound up by a little bit of rust. So same thing, spray our springs. We're gonna get back into this splined area and we're going to grease that really good and then what we can do is go to the other wheel and spin that and then we'll spray the other side because you can see it's completely dry here so now that whole thing is coated now we want to spray what the cable engages so spray the pivot points here spray the cable itself then we're going to spray the pivot points on the actual bracket here. So that thing pivots off of that. Then there's going to be the Z-bend of the cable. We're going to want to spray both sides of that, as well as the pivot point from this part down to the rod that engages the larger bracket. So we're gonna spray that. And then comes the part where we're going to spray in here and in here. Then once again, we'll spin our wheel around. We'll get the other side. And then just quickly comparing the MTD to this style once more, the MTD had that split main drive axle, right? So when you disengaged one side, the entire axle would be in a stationary position while power from the bottom drive shaft 
via the chain would only be driving one side. Again, that axle would be stationary. This side would drive, thus your machine would go to the left. On this one, it has a solid axle. And as you probably noticed, the pin on these wheels don't actually go through the wheel and the axle. They go on the outside, and then there was a little thrust washer as well to limit the amount of play on that wheel. So as you're driving along, again, it still has the solid axle. Power is being sent to both wheels. And even though we still have a solid axle, because the wheel is not pinned to the axle, and these are disengaged now, see how easily that spins. So this wheel is essentially in a state of free wheel and that side is being driven and that's how you get your power steering. It's incredibly simple but again you want to make sure this whole system is lubricated. And one further tip, if you ever find that when you go to pull the trigger, this side doesn't completely disengage, you can actually go up to this little bracket and slightly bend this up or I do have a video on how to lengthen a cable conduit, thus shortening the cable and putting more tension on it by threading these caps out from the black cable conduit. I can link that in the top right of your screen if you wanna watch that. But basically, let's say that you go to engage that trigger and your cable, for whatever reason, maybe it's stretched a little bit or something, just not pulling this up enough to completely disengage that cogged wheel, a simple bend to that bracket or a cable adjustment there on the end will get you back up and running again. Now, before I reassemble the cover and move over to that side, I wanted to show you a difference on the noise level from the ungreased side and the greased side. And we're gonna pull that and have a listen, and then we'll move over to the other side that I just lubricated. Hear how loud that is? Now let's try this side. Hardly any noise. So a little bit of lubricant goes a long way for these power steering mechanisms on these snowblowers here. It does look like there is a little bit of grease and or nickel anti-seize on this shaft here, but I am going to be using marine grade grease and or nickel anti-seize, but I would highly recommend this marine grade grease. So I'll get this cover reinstalled and then repeat all the steps for the right side. And before you get ahead of yourself and reinstall your wheels, it's much easier to reinstall the plastic access panel before putting your wheels on because the bolts go through the side on these. So instead of using a wrench, you can just use your impact and a socket. This has gotta be the one thing that I really dislike about these particular machines is these access panels here are plastic and they just clip in, Let's see if I can get a shot of that, to those little tabs there. And then they wrap around like that. So what I've found is a lot of times snow does get under there, which is not ideal, but also these tend to bow out and then snow can get in there. So, you know, they're not the greatest, but they do, I guess, a well enough job at keeping the snow and the water out from where your rubber friction disc is. So at this point, I still have to flip over these skid shoes here. You guys can see these are the polymer ones. I may be removing those for some steel ones just because I do have a concrete driveway with a troweled finish. So there is a little bit of grip to it. It's not smooth concrete. We did that to try to prevent the chance of slipping. I do have a video on how to properly adjust skid shoes. I can link that in the top right of the screen as well if you haven't seen that one. And right away, I should know whether or not my alternator or the stator is working if the headlight comes on because that one's not running on a switch. So the moment you start the engine, the headlight should illuminate and then the heated hand grips are on a switch. So if the headlight works, I'll just assume that the heated hand grips will work. However, nothing will work if I don't reconnect my ground wire. It's really simple things like that. That would completely throw you off if you didn't remember. And the only reason that I did remember that was because I have one bolt left. I even left myself a little note. So when we removed the engine, the 1450, we had to remove that little 10 millimeter bolt so that the ground wire wasn't attached to the engine. And that went into my parts tray. I already had a bolt in that, that engine because we assembled that on the workbench. Simple stuff like that, guys. So having a parts tray, super helpful. Save that bolt, they always come in handy. Well, that's gonna wrap up today's video. You'll wanna stay tuned for part four where we finally fire this machine up, test the alternator, make sure the headlight and the heated hand grips are working properly and finish up with this video series.
But with that being said, if you guys enjoyed the video, think about leaving me a thumbs up. You know, it really helps me out. You can click here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week, so be sure to stop on by next week, check channel out for new content, and as always, guys, thanks for watching.